Okay, I'm a level with you. I do not think that you should make beef wellington. It's a ton of work, it's very expensive, it's extremely error prone, and I don't think it's that good to eat. But if you wanna see me make a wellington, well, here you go. This is the last time, I'll tell you that. Maybe I'll throw a few usable ideas your way. You can, of course, buy frozen puff pastry, but I actually think the dish is better if you make what they call a rough puff pastry. Real machine-made puff pastry is just too delicate. It just flakes off. So for a homemade rough puff pastry, I am cutting one pound, 454 grams of cold butter into large cubes. Large chunks will roll out into very wide sheets, and that's what makes pastries flaky. Transfer those to a big bowl, and now I'll weigh an equal quantity of all-purpose flour, one-to-one -one butter to flour. There will be more flour later in the rolling process. If you use unsalted butter like I did, I would do about 15 grams of salt, that's a tablespoon of Morton Kosher, and for flavor and browning, a teaspoon or two of sugar will have a subtle effect. I'll toss that all together, mostly to get each butter cube coated in flour so that they won't stick to each other. Then it's time to work in just enough cold water to bring this into a shaggy, lumpy dough. Too much water will make the pastry tough in the end, so literally just enough to barely bring this into a single mass. Let it sit in the fridge for at least a half hour to firm the butter back up and to let the flour particles hydrate. Pull it back out and now it's much more cohesive. Flour the counter, flour the dough, and just start rolling. You gotta be really gentle on the first roll. It's liable to crack. Just roll a little and turn, roll a little and turn. Turning ensures that the bottom is getting floured and it's not sticking, and it helps you to roll every part of the dough evenly. And try to get it into something like a rectangle until it's about, yay thick, a centimeter maybe. Now fold the dough in on itself in thirds, like a letter. That moves the rougher edges inside where you can even them out in the next rolling, which will go much easier. The dough is getting more pliable, I don't have to be as gentle. Fold it again like a letter and repeat. We're gonna roll it and fold it a total of six times, flouring the dough and the counter every time. The flour you scatter on gets between the buttery layers, creating laminations that can separate when the dough puffs up with steam in the oven. After maybe the fourth fold, things start to get physically harder again. This is the gluten network starting to tense up. It requires a little more elbow grease, but it's really not that hard, and ten minutes of rolling later, here is the sixth and final fold. I'll roll it a little bit just to make the layers stick, but we don't need to roll it thin yet. Wrap it up in something, let the butter chill again in the fridge so that it doesn't melt and let the gluten relax again for another half hour at least. That much you could do days in advance. Lordy, there's so much that could go wrong with this dinner. It's almost as hazardous as the internet, but you know, I'm safer there with Aura, sponsor of this video. I mean, you've seen the internet, right? I work here all the time, and so I've gotten extortion attempts, people threatening to expose my secrets unless I send them money, which of course I don't. I send them to the FBI, but Aura can help me nip that in the bud. Aura is an easy to use app that protects you from scammers and hackers by scanning the dark web, looking for your passwords and such, and it alerts you fast if it finds anything. Aura found my stuff 14 times. Then there's also the People Finder websites. They scrape public tax records so that they can publish your physical address and stuff like that. Aura will send takedown requests to those sites on your behalf regularly. You get real-time alerts on suspicious credit activity, computer virus protection, parental controls. It comes with a VPN and a password manager. One app that does the work of seven others. And it's not just about security. It's about reducing robocalls and other annoying stuff like that. If you sign up right now with my link in the description, Aura will give you a free two-week trial. Find out how much of your private information they find over those two weeks. Aura.com slash Adam to get your free trial or scan the QR code. Thank you, Aura. Anyway, I now need to prep my beef. A Wellington is made with a center cut tenderloin roast. And assuming you can use the extra meat elsewhere, it's probably a lot more cost effective to just buy a whole vacuum packed tenderloin. The butchery is not that hard. There are two extra muscles we need to get off. This one up at the fat end is the aliacus muscle. You can see the seam of gristle connecting it to the main psoas major muscle. If you're unsure, literally just pull it and it will tear along that seam up to a 
at points, you may have to get in there with your knife and finish the job. But if we didn't take this off, all of that connective tissue between these muscles would be inside our roast, and that would be gross. The Eliacus is a great mini roast that you can use another day. Then there's the psoas minor muscle, also known as the chain. It's a very thin, long muscle that runs alongside the psoas major. Again, if you just pull, the seam will present itself. It's the first thing that tears. The chain is full of tasty fat. It's great for kebabs. We're left with the psoas major, which we just need to trim of all of that exterior connective tissue, especially the silver skin there. Just get up underneath it and shave it off. You don't have to get every gram of it off, but most of it. It's super chewy. Then there's also big globs of intermuscular fat you probably want to shave off, especially on the flip side where the vertebrae used to be. I'm less worried about trimming fat. There you go. Nice and clean. Now, really only the center portion works for a Wellington. The ends are too thin. They'd be horribly overcooked. Use those for something else. I'm going to freeze all of my edible trimmings for another day. That center cut roast, fully butchered, would probably cost about as much as the whole tenderloin. Season that two pound roast aggressively with salt and pepper. There's a lot of meat there to flavor. And I'll massage that with a thin film of oil before dropping it into an extremely hot pan. As hot as you can go without burning anything. The goal is to get some brown flavor on the outside of this while cooking the inside, not at all. So I'm going to roll this around and then not a minute later, out it comes. But while this pan is hot, I'm going to drop in all of my inedible trimmings, all of that silver skin and everything. This will give flavor and body to my sauce. While that browns, I'll roughly chop some shallots. I would use a whole big onion instead if I had one. Super rough. It's all getting strained out in the end and in with the beef trimmings to brown. Once I've got nice color all around, I'll drop in a tiny spoon of tomato paste. Not worth opening a whole can just for this. Just use it if you've got it handy. Brown that for a second. And before stuff starts burning, I will deglaze with like half a bottle of red wine. You could just use water. If you want to use a little fruit juice, just use a tiny splash. Otherwise, the sauce will be way too sweet. The advantage of cooking with wine is most of the sugar has been fermented away. Even still, I will top this off with at least as much water as wine. I always think sauces made with straight red wine are way too strong. Now we just simmer those trimmings for as long as we've got. An hour, at least, I'd say. So the traditional filling that goes between the beef and the crust is a mushroom duxelle. My wife Lauren doesn't like mushrooms, so she suggested pureed greens bound with some breadcrumbs. We'll try that. I'll put in half a bag of baby spinach for color and for flavor. I've got a bunch of fresh parsley and a few sage leaves just because I have those. Some pepper, a pinch of salt, maybe some ground ginger to make it Christmassy. And then to get a moldable texture, it's about one part breadcrumbs to two parts greens. I'm using panko because it's more absorbent and one function of this layer in any Wellington is to soak up juices from the roast so that the pastry doesn't get wet. I'll puree that smooth, and now I should be able to fit in the rest of that 6-ounce, 170-gram bag of spinach, the rest of that bunch of parsley, and a matching dose of panko, etc. Blend, blend. I'll give it a squeeze of lime juice. Might help prevent some enzymatic browning, but I don't want to use too much or it'll taste weird. There we go. You need a texture kind of like modeling clay. Okay, what's very traditional is to coat the the seared roast in mustard, a nice thick layer. Now I'm gonna grab a sheet of plastic wrap and lay down enough of my green stuff to coat the bottom of the roast. Whether it's this or the normal creamy mushroom paste, the trick is getting it pretty much as thin as you can get it, which won't be that thin. Roast on top, mold the rest all the way around. Don't worry about the ends, you're just gonna trim those off. It'd also be traditional to make some crepes to wrap around this, again, to absorb juices. I'm a bet on the absorbing power of panko to do that job. It'd also be traditional to wrap this in thin sliced parma ham. I think that's just excessive. I'll wrap that up, take out my pastry, and stow the beef in here while we roll a final time. We can reuse that plastic. Plenty of flour, and now we roll into a shape that will envelop our roast and thickness about a half a centimeter, maybe. Oh, last thing, I need to beat an egg with a little water to make an egg wash for glue. Roast goes on. I'm going to have some excess pastry, but that's better than not having enough. You can use the excess for something else, or you can cut out little strips for a lattice decoration on top. Paint some egg wash on that seam so that it seals. Hide the seam on the bottom. 
crimp the ends, wrap in plastic, and this much you could do the day before, throw it in the fridge. Sauce is ready to strain. I'm gonna do it in my gravy separator so that I can get out some of the fat. I've got some cheesecloth in there to get out finer particles because we're being fancy today. There's no way I'm not gonna spill this, and yes, I'm spilling. You could just throw this in the fridge the day before. The fat would solidify on top and you could lift it off. Or do it right now with a gravy separator. A little fresh thyme in there to infuse. I'm just gonna reduce this a little bit. If you want a thick sauce, you could reduce it to a glaze. I want a thinner, more voluminous sauce that I can really flood the plate with, so that's enough. Time out. Now I will lower the heat so there's no bubbling, and I will gradually emulsify in a ton of cold butter, monte a beurre. As long as you go slow and you don't get the butter too hot, the sauce will accept a nearly endless amount of butter. This tastes great, and it helps you get the sauce volume that you need to serve everybody. That was salted butter, so I won't need to season this. I'll pour it into a sauce boat, and I can reheat that in the microwave right before dinner on low power. If it boils, the emulsion breaks and it won't be thick anymore, so be careful. A little flour on my sheet pan to keep the wellington from sticking, and on it goes. To try to cook this without a probe thermometer would be an act of pure self-hatred. It's the only way to know what's happening. Paint this with the rest of our egg wash. That'll make it brown and shiny. And a very easy way to decorate is to score the top with a knife after you've painted with the egg. That'll get you a better color contrast. A leaf is a pretty easy shape to make. Just make your cuts very shallow. I went too deep on a lot of these, and you'll see them spread too much in the oven. The lines get too thick. You want shallow cuts for fine lines. In my oven, 425 Fahrenheit convection works, 220C, but you can adjust as it bakes if it looks like the outside isn't going to be brown enough by the time the beef is done, you can jack up the heat as you go. The key is to take it out way before the beef is done as you want it. I'm pulling it at 110 Fahrenheit 43C. The beef is encased in its own little oven. There's going to be a ton of carryover as this rests. Look, we went from 110 to 135 Fahrenheit outside the oven. That's almost medium. I would like it rarer. At the last minute, I'll steam some broccolini until fork tender. Those always look nice. You really need a serrated knife to cut this, or the pastry will just shatter. And it'll shatter if you try to do a thin slice. It's got to be thick and chunky. We've got six portions, tops from this roast. Flood the plate with sauce, lay on the wellington, vegetables, and there you go. Is it worth it? Absolutely not, in my opinion. How are you even supposed to eat these things? They just fall apart. Not a fan. Though that sauce is fire, as the kids say. I think for Christmas dinner this year, I'm just going to do a normal tenderloin roast with that sauce. But, you know, you do you.